Okay. Well, everybody, I'd like to welcome you tonight. My name is Tamara Scroft. I'm the executive director of the Albany Institute. Our program tonight is Picturing New York's Past, a conversation with artist Len Tantillo and writer Russell Shorto. I am standing in the galleries of the Albany Institute of History and Art in the middle of the Len Tantillo exhibition, a, a sense of a uh, sense of time, history paintings by Len Tantillo. Tonight, we are hosting our first hybrid program. We have about 30 or 30 or 40 people in the audience here with me and 170 people on Zoom. So this is a, a new experience for us, but I think it's an experience that we will become very accustomed to and it will be part of uh, normal programming activities as we're going forward. Uh, before I introduce Len and Russell, we have a special guest with us this evening, the Consul General of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in New York, Ermin Quarles Vidal. The Consul General is visiting our region to meet with a variety of representatives from the cultural and business sector, sectors, excuse me. And as you can imagine, a tour and a stop at Len Tantillo's exhibition and program is a bust. I would like to also to acknowledge the financial support that the Albany Institute has received from the Dutch Cultural USA program and cultural shared heritage which really enabled us to present many of the, many of the paintings that uh, Len Tantillo, Tantillo has done related to the New York Dutch experience. And also programming such as this that we're all enjoying here tonight. So at this time, I'm very pleased to in introduce uh, the Consul General of the Netherlands of New York. Thank you, Thomas, um, for your kind introduction and congratulations on this wonderful event, wonderful new hybrid event. It's such a joy to be here with you and it's a privilege to be there with you in your, wherever you are. <laughs> um, thank you to the Albany Institute of History and Art for hosting this event today. And welcome to everybody here in the room and welcome to everybody on Zoom. This is my first hybrid event in this sense, and I'm uh, participating, uh, and I thank you for uh, your time to join us here, um, either from the comfort of your home or here in, in person. The department, the cultural department of our consulate uh, promotes and supports Dutch arts and culture in the US. Our Dutch American heritage is very important to us. We aim to assist our American partners to preserve that heritage and make it accessible and visible to the public. It is therefore a pleasure for us to support both the program and the exhibition, A Sense of Time, the Historical Art of Len Tantil. There are not many images left of this 17th century Dutch New York. Thanks to the incredible work of Len, we can visualize that past and imagine what it must have been like to sail into the harbor of New Amsterdam or walk the streets of Fort Orange. Where Len Tantillo brings New England to the life on the canvas, Russell Shorto um, vividly does so with his words. In his book, The Island at the Center of the World, I got three copies when I, uh, before I came here to New York. <laughs> um, has opened up the world of New Netherlands to a large audience, not only here in uh, the United States, but definitely also in the Netherlands. Both Len and Russell are wonderful ambassadors for the Dutch history of New York. And I look forward to learning more about their creative process. Enjoy the program. Thank you. Thank you very, for your very kind words about the exhibit, uh, the Institute and Albany and our two wonderful speakers. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Len and Russell for our conversation tonight. Len Tantillo is a remarkable painter who has specialized in history paintings during his 40 year career. 
He is one of the most noted painters of historical subjects and marine views of our time and is recognized for his ability to capture specific moments and visualize places of the past through our paintings. And I always, when I look at Len's work, I can just imagine, you know, walking down the streets or sailing up the Hudson River. So it's very exciting. And the Albany Institute is very pleased to present this impressive 40 year retrospective by Len Tantillo. We have over 100 works here. They're by 53 lenders. And if you haven't had a chance to come to the Albany Institute, the exhibition is going to be up until July 25th, so there's plenty of time. So Russell Shorto is a remarkable journal journalist, author, and historian who is best known for tonight's audience on his book, The New York Dutch, The Island of the Center of the World, which we heard about just a few minutes ago. And I will say Russell's research, uh, much of his research is based on the work accomplished at the New Netherland Institute, Charlie Daring in particular, and his team. And I'd also like to say that Russell received in 2009, a Dutch knighthood in or the Order of Orange Nassau, for strengthening the ties between the Netherlands and the United States. So, and this is through his publications in particular, but you know, Russell has been working. Uh, uh, um, it's not that you've gone behind beyond the Dutch, but you have a new book on the revolu uh, revolutionary, excuse me, revolution song, a story of American freedom and small time the story of my family and the mob. So I just, that just uh, came out. So now what I would like to do is welcome you to the conversation between the artist, Len Cantillo, and the writer, Russell Shorto, about how each uses historical records to recreate the past, one with pain and the other with words. So at this moment, what we're going to do is have a little bit of a change and this podium is gonna magically go away. Russell and, and Len are going to appear um, uh, seated and we're gonna be with you in just one minute. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tamis. Thank you, Herman. Uh, thanks to the Albany Institute and the Dutch consulate and all of you and the people who are zooming in. Um, Len, you know, not too shabby. No. <laughs> you know, uh, I think uh, one of the best things about this evening, or one of the things that I am the most delighted about, is that I got top billing over you. All exists from a hundred paintings. No. Well, yeah. That's okay. Here's I. You know, I've I've seen so many of Len's paintings over the years. Um, and many of them uh, just reproduced. So it's so remarkable to see some of these um, in person, to see all of them collected in person. And walking around, you know, all these things that I had associated with your work, meticulous, historical, you know, detailed. Um, but what the, struck me for the first time is, it, it, I hope you wouldn't be offended if I said, are you a romantic in your painting? <laughs> I think I am. Now, I re that really comes through now when I see them all like this. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with, um, uh, you know, developing an image that's going to have some kind of uh, emotional impact. And so, so you kind of reach into that part of your, you know, your thinking. And for an artist, it has to do with color and shape. Um, but I've, I've always felt that if I can engage, um, um, a, a viewer emotionally, then I can say something about the subject. But the emotional response has to come before that. Mm -hmm. If it was just history, I think it would be a more difficult um, task. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but before we get uh, uh, too far uh, into this, I really wanna thank um, the consulate for uh, uh, stepping up and uh, being one of the major sponsors uh, for this exhibition, and um, it's just been it's it's been wonderful. I mean, it's it's been it's a difficult time because of the pandemic, but um, but very very heartening to know that I have that kind of support from uh, the Dutch 
people. And I want to make sure that I say thank you uh, for that. So um, another, uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of these paintings I've seen over the years many times, but always in a in a in print or in a book or something. And several of them, I said before, it was almost like um, seeing it in person. It's like you know a, a Vermeer or a Rembrandt or something you've seen year after year, and suddenly there you are in the museum. Uh, standing in front of it. Uh, that's how I felt about several of these. And one in particular I want to ask you about, I think it's called uh, Winter in the Mohawk Valley. Mm -hmm. And it's two um, Mohawk men kind of trudging up a hill uh, to this uh, settlement, these uh, longhouses. And what really struck me for the first time is the time of day. It's almost night. Yeah. And the whole painting is like, it's got this kind of charcoal wash over it, it's, the light is really fading, except for that area that where there's, you can't even see the fire, you can only see the light from the fire. Yeah, have you ever noticed um, on a snow covered, uh, cold winter evening, um, when the snow appears to be almost luminescent, it, it's, it's, it's dusk, but there seems to be almost a blue glow coming off of the snow itself. And that's always intrigued me. And that, that's kind of what I was trying to do with that. And um, if for an artist who's interested in painting something that has that kind of luminescent blue, um, if you're familiar with the work of uh, Maxfield Parrish, he could do that. He could create a, a depth and a, an energy from colors, but especially from blue. So I studied his work and, um, and I tried to bring that into it. Now there's another part of that, of the story of that painting that's, uh, it's uh, less romantic and uh, a little less artistic, but um, that was done quite a while ago. And uh, at that time I was still using uh, live models. And so I had uh, some friends with a son who was about the right age to dress up as the character. And, um, and I wanted to get that sense of fatigue. You know, if, if you've ever trudged through the snow, it's, it's, it's exhausting. And so I wanted that to, to try to get that out of my actor, my character. Um, so um, he was dressed pretty heavily in furs and, um, you know, I, I, I had found a wig, I put a wig on him, and um, it was the hottest day in July. <laughs> and um, he was in snowshoes. And so I had him walk up a hill. And I'd say, no, you have to try that again, walk up a hill. And now he's really drenched. And I had him do it about 20 times. Mm -hmm. And then eventually got to a point where he was struggling to get up that hill. And his, um, his parents were there and his mother felt really sorry for him. And so she, uh, she got a leaf blower and she started <laughs> blowing this leaf blower on him. So if you look at the painting, you'll notice that the wig is sort of blowing out. That's the leaf blower. <laughs> <laughs> you actually had that as a little yeah, yeah, humorous touch. Well, not a humor. I, I was trying to make you feel that. Oh God, there's 170 people. <laughs> oh, this is a disaster. But yeah, that's, that's that's the story behind it. But I, I, it does. I think it does evoke winter. Yeah, and that, but that illustrates the point of what you said a minute ago that. It, the emotion in the moment is important for you. So with something like that, I mean, it's historical and it's a very specifically um, staged moment, um, but it's like an emotion that you're trying to, it's a feeling that you're trying yeah, to go. You know, I, I'll bet anything that you've, you have had the same issue. Um, I'm not a Native American and here I have been commissioned to do this piece. So that and was a commission. It was a commission, okay. yeah. And I, um, you know, I, I wanted, I didn't want to disrespect the, the Iroquois nation or the Mohawk people specifically, uh, but I culturally, I, I don't understand um, the depth of their uh, ideology. Um, but one of the things that I thought I could bring to that, that would be uh, a common uh, denominator that would cross culture and, and uh, cross the, the span of time was winter. And winter is something that we who live in the Northeast 
We know what it's like when it's uh, 20 below zero. We know how hard it is to be warm. And it doesn't take much imagination to think what surviving in a building that's made of bark, that's only a, an inch or so uh, thick, that there's, there's, there's very little to protect you from the elements except your own ingenuity. And so I thought instead of trying to depict some kind of ceremony, some kind of religious uh, event that would take me into a territory that I wouldn't understand at all, I thought I would stick with the environmental story. Yeah, yeah. And it's not just winter, but to me, it's that, you know, the, the, oh, the, oh, go look at it if you're here, uh, if you haven't seen it, but almost the whole canvas is dark. I mean, you can barely make them out except yeah. for that light. And yeah. that's, the, that's the difference. It's like, Night is descending, and here is yeah. civilization. That, yeah, that, that, and, that and they are bringing, they're bringing something. They, right, they, right. They've succeeded. Yeah. They have something for uh, survival. They have their turkey, yeah. and uh, yeah. So it's it's there's there's um, a reward for the for, for the effort, and uh, I, I'm sure that this must you must come across this the same obstacle and and trying to tell a story respectfully, and um, you know. Uh, well, there's a, the whole question of truth and how you get at truth and uh, how you convey it in, in words, of course, you can say directly to the reader, you can use words like it may have been the case or, you know, all the evidence points to, yeah. you know, uh, you can't do that in print. You know, I mean, in, in, in graphically, you're making a statement, here it is. Yeah. Uh, so then in the caption, maybe you get to do that to kind of mm -hmm. uh, step back a little bit. But um, so you, in a way, it's a lot easier. Yeah, I, um, I know that you keep asking me these questions, but I want to ask you, when, you, when you're writing, I, this happens to me when I paint these things, I get so far into the story that I really start, to, I can project myself into it. I, can, I really start to think about this as a real place. These, uh, these are real people with real emotional responses to each other. Um, and I know that you write that way. I mean, I, that's what I love about your writing. And what I, uh, what I think is, is amazing about it is that you, you do that. You understand your characters and you have them interact in, uh, in very credible ways. Um, I think it's, a, yeah, I think you have to, to uh, do enough digging, enough research, you know, as with a painting, you know, you're kind of creating a backdrop and then you're focusing on maybe it's two figures who are kind of occupying the center. Um, and I think it's really important to, to become sympathetic to every character, everybody you're spending time yeah. with, even yeah. if you don't necessarily yourself feel that way you know for this moment i have to understand yeah you know I, I, you have to understand slavery from the perspective of a slave owner and then you turn around and from the enslaved you know you have to do that and then you can step back and say you know make your two cents uh, you know add your two cents to the thing yeah. but you have to you know, that and that's what i think gives a little bit of a feeling of verisimilitude mm. um and uh um the, the whole process then is, I mean, it all starts with research and that's why, you know, for the book like Island at the Center of the World, the only way I, the reason I wrote it was Charlie Gehring and Yanni Venema, all this uh, translation of, of documents, which gives you, you know, the incredible detail of it. When you sink into those, you know, these court cases of like, you know, he stole my pig and he stole my wife, you know, just, I mean, I mean, and, and really detailed stuff about, uh, uh, I mean, there's rape cases that are that are very much like, you know, bring the next defendant kind of thing, you yeah, know, yeah. Um, as well as things that you can just tease out of them. I mean, Charlie today was talking about uh, a document that was describing a number of different uh, um, uh, uh, items, including a cowbell. So, well, from that, we know they use cowbells on their cows. Yeah. And then he, <laughs> he went on to make a whole yeah. other trade of of inferences and that kind of thing. It's yeah, like, you know, I can work with that. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it, and it, what it does is it triggers a whole bunch of, a whole series of new ideas. Exactly. Places that you weren't even gonna go. Exactly, yeah. Or, or some revelation that changes maybe the way you thought some uh, way an outcome might yeah. work, yeah. you know, yeah. that you, it kind of uh, evolves into something different. Yeah. Why did you, um, I mean, it's, you're, there aren't many um, fine artists who focus on history. What is it um, 
what is there something particularly important about that? Because you use history then mm -hmm. to to make a kind of an emotional point that's inside you. But you're you're really focused on history. And by the way, he and I've, I've been to Lynn's studio and, and seen his process and the kind of research he puts into things. And and it's as detailed as any academic historian. So so you want to layer in all of that. Uh, all of that history. It, I think it's it's mostly about um, curiosity, um, uh, hearing something. Or uh, when I was a kid, um, I grew up um, in basically our house was attached to a grocery store, my dad's store. So I grew up basically in the store, and uh, it was a little mom and pop store. Uh, well, you probably saw it. It's 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 uh, the first painting in the exhibition. My pop, my dad's store. And um, you know, when I was nine years old and, and working in there, it was a different time in America. It was the fifties, and there were great storytellers. You know, you know, from when you were a kid, people that could tell a story, um, and and just they they could tell it in such a, a vivid way. For me, anyway, they could bring me there. So it might be a story about. Um, uh, World War One, because we had a lot of these veterans from World War One. You know, they would come up by uh, chewing tobacco or something. Um, but they would, they would, they would talk to my dad, and maybe he might have them in the back of the store. There was a little table, and they had some coffee back there. So they might sit back there with my father for a while and just talk. But I would listen to those stories, and I would try to imagine, okay, what was, what would it have been like in? France or Belgium, you know, 1915 or whenever, and this, this, you know, this this old man was a boy then, and, and, and it, but it wouldn't matter what the story was because there were farmers there, so there were stories about uh, a frost coming to the apple orchards. This would be in, you know, when the buds were just forming, and uh, they'd have to scramble and come up with all kinds of. I mean, in, in those days, they did some weird stuff like they had smudge pots, they burn uh, kerosene and put the smudge pots and hopefully the whatever, the, there'd be enough smoke or something to, to, to uh, save the, the orchards. But it was, there was a panic about it and there was a, um, it was life-threatening to them, but vivid to me. Mm -hmm. and, and the details. So, yes, yeah, so I could see that. Yeah. And, um, um, so I guess it, what it did was awaken a kind of a curiosity in me. So er, every one of these paintings engaged me, and um, um, and I I never knew how they would come out. I could sometimes start a painting and not know where how it would end how it would end up. Do you ever did you ever write like that where you didn't know how a story would end? Um, yeah, I mean, you, I spent a lot of time. I mean, I. I you have the basic concept, yeah, but that doesn't mean you know the beginning, middle, or end exactly. I mean, you know. Have you have you, you know, done a book where the ending isn't even what you thought it might be when you started? Uh, the exact ending, yeah. Um, you know, there's there's the there's the ending, there's the um, your narrative, your overall narrative arc, and then there's the specific telling. You know, uh, and what I've uh, one thing that I've I've uh, learned is that. Endings are about closure, but you don't want to give too much closure because then it feels fake. Uh -huh. uh, so there's a small story within it. And if you close off that small story, the reader feels satisfied. But if you, at the same time, you leave open all of these, you know, history and yeah, you know, yeah, all of these bigger yeah. questions, yes. then you're kind of paying homage to the, the looseness of, of reality. So yeah. if you achieve both of those well, then the reader feels satisfied, but also not like you're trying to tie everything up. You know? well, and for, um, uh, where do you get inspiration from? I mean, what, uh, do you get it from past research or conversations with historians? Well, I mean, in terms of, uh, I mean, there's there's the material, there, there's the research you're going to do, but then also, you know, I might be, I mean, it might be a painting that gives you, oh, that's a way of looking at it. That's a different way of thinking. So about you, it. if you do that with my work, you should credit me in the book. <laughs> <laughs> when, if and when that happens. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh my uh, God. I've tried to help him so much. <laughs> um, um, what was I going to say? Uh, but, 
and and other obviously other works, other books that you read, and it could be something completely unrelated, a novel or you know, a book about a different time period. Mm -hmm. And it's just a way that you know it's a choice that the author made. And you, oh, you realize, oh, I don't have to keep following the same track. If it's feeling flat, I can jump to this other event or storyline yeah. and then pull back. You know, it's a lot of it is the arrangement, how you how you cut away and come back. For me, it's uh, maps. It's, yeah. it's because there aren't a lot of uh, visuals in the in the uh, area that I try to uh, keep my work. This mm -hmm. sort of New York State uh, yeah. story, um, but there are maps and um, cartographers um, try. I mean, they they all come at it from um, a different uh, perspective. So if it's a military map, it's about the defenses or whatever. Maybe it's a map that's being used to uh, secretly convey to the enemy what, uh, what, what's going on. Or there are sometimes maps that have more to do with uh, industry or maps that have to do with um, more social kinds of things. And so- um, Or like the Costello plan, which is a, what do you yeah, call that kind of- It's view? a kind of isometric. Isometric. Yeah, it's an isometric. But one Where you're the, sort of, it's sort yeah, of you're, a 3D you're, it's, view. It's uh, skewed. Yeah. It's not like a plan looking straight down on it, but there's a lot of information in there. So here is this uh, Belgian cartographer in Manhattan in uh, um, whatever, 1690s 60s, or 80s or whatever. And, um, and he's conveying what he is, He's recorded this, and so I, I can look at that, and it doesn't take very much um, to uh, start to get into it and start to think about, oh, these buildings were of this scale in this part of Manhattan, um, or um, uh, just uh, how things are oriented, or the connection with um, um, the harbor, thing, things like Talk that. Talk about your, because as I say, I've, I've been to Lens Studio, and I mean, you used to talk about your process. You used to work with, used to build physical models. If, for example, it was New Amsterdam or, or some town. Yeah. And then you would move those around to find the angle that most yeah. interests you, right? Yeah. Did I, was I paying attention? Yeah, you were paying attention. But the, uh, uh, sort of. No, you were <laughs> not paying but, uh, but then you switched yeah, to. Yeah, like uh, probably the last of the, the major physical models um, was um, was done for um, um, an Albany painting that isn't in this show. It's it's the biggest painting I ever did. It's it's ten feet long and it took me a year to paint. But uh, it's Albany in um, around 1780. And um, when you work with models, they have to be um, large enough so that when you uh, photograph them you get enough depth of field to kind of see what the, what the uh, geometry looks like as you kind of move away from the foreground. And um, so th these models were, were sort of big. And when I started out, this story, I, I think I told you this story. Um, when I started out, the model was on my coffee table and I could take, you know, I could move lights around. I could move my camera around to kind of get an idea of uh, the subject. And then the model grew, got a little bit bigger. I added a few more buildings and then it moved to the floor. And my studio doesn't have a huge amount of space, but it's, you know, it's fairly large. I think, you know, about 18 or 20 feet or so. Well, the model was now on the floor and um, I couldn't look down the streets anymore because um, I could put my head on the floor but I'd be kind of sideways, sort of trying to get the angle that I wanted. So um, I made a periscope with a couple of mirrors that was off the floor so I could move the periscope around and I could look down the streets and take, you know, photograph it that way. But it got bigger, the model got bigger. And uh, then it didn't fit in the studio anymore. And a friend of mine had uh, restored a, um, uh, an old piano factory. And he let me have a corner of this warehouse to set it up. So it got to be very big. It got to be like over 30 feet long. But at that point, I realized that there's a limitation to what I can do with physical models. And um, that was when uh, I was around the time of um, Shrek, the movie Shrek. And my kids were younger and we, we had the movie and uh, 
uh, we watched, uh, not me, they watched the movie, but then after the movie, they had how they did all the special effects. And that's when I started to see how this computer graphic thing could work. And I was, became curious about it and um, was, um, met a few more people who were involved with it and then started using uh, the program pretty crudely at first. I think the first digital model um, that I used was a painting that's over there. I know you can't see it at home, but it's the uh, Ice House painting. And, but, but there was enough there that I could get sort of the geometrical relationship to things. And once I started to see the potential of, of uh, using a computer to construct something, that's when I, I did Schenectady in the 1690s. I, I built models of of Albany in different time periods. And I built the big model of Manhattan, the, the, which had all the streets and all the buildings that are in the Costello plan. So now I could travel along the Strand or you know, move up William Street or um, go over by the fort or look back or maybe even take a slightly bird's eye uh, perspective and do that with confidence that at least now, now I am uh, speculating about what the buildings are. But, um, but the footprint, I, I'm confident that the footprint is correct, that the shapes are right. Yeah, talk a little bit about that, because um, this is, in a way, all about truth and the you limitations. Know, you, know, of... you know what, one time you and I did a, a, a program, it, was, it might have been the first time we did the, the Stuyvesant program. And you mentioned to me, you said, you showed many more slides than I did. <laughs> so I don't want that to happen with our conversation. This is a, <laughs> of course, around. I mind. know. I have and questions. I pretend, they have questions. Pretend somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, truth. I mean, because if it's a historical painting, you say this is connected in 1652 yeah. or whatever. Um, that presupposes, okay, that's what this is. And you know, people think, okay, like like it's a photograph. Of course, they know it's not. Um, so you are using things like maps and documents. And if a document mentions, I don't know, a thatched roof or something, then that gives you a clue. So you're pulling together different clues like that. But at a certain point, you're saying, I have to interpret. You know, I don't know that this building or this well, street looks you know, exactly. We, we, we use some of the same sources. Yeah. Uh, sure. Dennis of course we do. Yeah. And yeah. Charlie Guerin yeah. and Paul Huey. And um, those historians have dug into those subjects for their careers. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, I think maybe that's the most valuable resource because of what they know and, and that kind of uh, cross-pollination of ideas where they have interacted with other historians and tempered maybe some of the things that, that uh, they believe. But I mean, I know uh, that uh, when um, uh, I, I'm networking with a solid, group of, uh, of uh, historians that um, if I can harness that somehow or bring it into to the work that uh, that also elevates. The, so the if you're, you know, because I know you uh, mostly with your New Netherlands work, but if you're in, I don't know, the 1920s or something, are you networking with a, a group of yeah. people from that era? Yeah. Oh God, I've had some great experiences with, uh, uh, um, well, one, one that was just uh, wonderful uh, was um, uh, working with Dave Gould, who has now passed away, um, on uh, railroad paintings. And he was, uh, oh, I mean, you think, you, you know, there's a subject that maybe you think, okay, there's plenty of books and I can, but not when you start to move off into something very specific, like uh, uh, one, one of the paintings that, um, that I, I worked on with, uh, Dave was the uh, Schoharie Valley Railroad. And uh, it wasn't an engine that you're gonna find in a book. It was, it was, a, it was a complete uh, mishmash. You know, it's the kind of thing that started off as this kind of pure uh, machine. And then over time as wear and tear parts were changed and it evolved from being, from using wood as a fuel to using coal as a fuel and Dave and um, Len Killian, uh, uh, both of those guys uh, would come to my studio once a week and critique my digital model as I was building it. And I didn't like, 
I didn't really know anything. I mean, I didn't know what, I didn't know there was a difference in the gauge of tracks. Um, I didn't know how the boiler had been details, mm -hmm. but they did. And so when they would come over, they'd say, no, it wasn't made like this, it was made like that. And then I'd make adjustments. And um, I, that I, I, if, I if, if, if we had everyone in this gallery who helped me with the painting, they wouldn't all fit in here. There's so many people that have helped me and, um, and that I have um, benefited from. And yet you, you don't know everything about that subject. So yeah. case in point, how many different views of Ford or Orange? Oh, know. how many different yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a funny one because I did the first one um, in the 1980s and um, the last one around 2009. And in between, I think I did 14 other ones or something like that. And um, I remember uh, getting a critical review in a newspaper where the writer said, uh, Tantello really doesn't know what Ford Orange looks like. Mm -hmm. Well, I took that as a compliment because I really don't know what Ford Orange looks <laughs> like. And so that's why I did it 14 different yeah. ways. And in each one you've learned a little bit more yeah. and maybe a little bit closer. You know, when you were mentioning before about uh, a detail that uh, you weren't aware of that, uh, that sort of makes a difference. Well, um, Charlie had told me about uh, a letter that was written about um, a drunk falling off of the bridge at Fort Orange. Now, I don't know whether he was tried or fined or whatever, but he was trying to get back into the fort, coming to the main gate and fell off of a bridge. Well, the first time I painted Fort Orange, the moat didn't continue around the front because I thought that it just surrounded it on three sides. But knowing that that guy fell off a bridge going into the entry gate, it gave me that piece of information yeah, 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 yeah. that, that the moat went all the way around. Right. So those are the kinds of accidental bits of information. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, that and the backbone to, to it is, I mean, your, what role does your training as an architect play? Quite a lot, I think. It's uh, because I'm not satisfied with just a, a, a flat, two-dimensional understanding of, of of a place, a building, an object, whatever that is, a, 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 a ship, a barge, a locomotive. I want to understand it as a three-dimensional thing. And uh, even though you can't see that in the paintings, I think sometimes um, viewers can sense it, that there's, a, there's an understanding about the other side of this or what happens outside of the frame of the painting, because there's so much information there that it you can just imagine how, how it would look if you turned your head and looked maybe the other way. I, I want to build that in, and that's definitely part of um, my architectural background. And you know, I know that um, you know, sometimes I have a lot of friends who are artists, and um, and they're you know, they're very, very talented and they're very expressive, and they don't paint in this style at all. And um, um, and we're not really, I don't know, I guess we're painters, but we're not really, we're not aligned as painters. We're, they, they are doing something very different than this. Mm -hmm. When I, when I uh, began doing this 40 years ago, when I actually started to get serious about painting, I always wanted this. I wanted all the work to tell one story or to be about one thing and maybe more about time and evolution than about uh, uh, how I felt about uh, the colors of summer or something mm -hmm. like that. So, so really uh, what is in this exhibition and what is in the book, A Sense of Time, is something that I kind of designed to happen, that, that it would be, uh, it, I am humbled by the fact that I, I wish I was a better painter because these stories are so rich and so uh, um, compelling. Um, but um, this is what I could do. And so this is, this, is, this is what I did. When we were talking on the phone about this, you said something like, I, I never want to put myself in yeah. the painting. Um, yeah. I mean, what you just said is kind of the opposite. 
it's like this is all you, right? So. I guess it is. Now, we, you know, we started to have this conversation because for anybody that hasn't read Small Time, it's, it's one, it's, it's, first of all, it's a great book and it's beautifully written and the characters are very, very rich. And, um, but it's, um, it's such a brave work uh, because you have, you have done an amazing job of expressing a part of you that's, it's, it's not easily, uh, it, it, it doesn't, you, it doesn't, it doesn't really come from the other books. It doesn't, Island has its own thing. Um, Amsterdam has its own thing. But small time really is a piece of you that you, you, you're sharing with the world. You can't uh, avoid it if you're going to write about this. This is a book about my grandfather, who I was named after, who was uh, a mob figure in my hometown. Um, and so I started with the idea that I would um, do what I do in my books. It's history. And, and to me, it was uh, I was going to be, in a way, using the, my hometown and my grandfather to tell the story of the small town mob in America, which was everywhere. It was in Schenectady and Scranton and Amarillo, Texas and, and Johnstown, Pennsylvania, my home. Uh, but I then, you know, so I fooled myself into thinking, okay, this is a history yeah. book like yeah. my others. Yeah. And of course you always put yourself in your work. Yeah. Um, but then it, didn't, it wasn't too long before I realized, of course, it's gotta be personal. I'm writing about someone with my name, you yeah. know, who I was named after. Yeah. Um, and then I was using my father as he was my kind of research partner in looking for his father, who he never really knew because his father was very kind of opaque. And um, uh, so then it, you know, by dint of, you know, the way these things work, it was about my grandfather, but it was about my, it became in our, my dad and me talking about this and talking to other people, interviewing people around town and going to the sites it became about the two of them and why, I mean, my whole life, they didn't speak to each other, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so what was that about? But yeah. we couldn't, you know, with family, we also couldn't talk about that. Yeah. Um, and we couldn't do it over, we couldn't, I couldn't say to him, so why didn't you speak and what, you know, yeah. you, I, you have to be, you know, you build up these yeah. walls and things. So yeah. we had to kind of do that or use the person we were interviewing as kind of yeah. a way to do that. Well, you know, what, what I got out of the book was, um, not so much about the, uh, uh, the texture of mob life. What I got out of the book was the, um, I loved the people. I loved the characters. I loved the respect that you show for, uh, for uh, these people that meant something to you or that became something important to you as you were working on the project. But it was mostly the human side of all of that. And, um, um, so I think it's 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 very uh, well. It's we both. The, the funny thing is, we both have spent a chunk of our life uh, on Dutch New York, yeah. but we're both Italian Americans yeah. from small towns. Yeah. I mean, so what does that have to yeah. do? Yeah, don't you get? I get that all the time. Yeah. Well, there's two questions. There's the thing about being Italian and doing paintings of the Dutch. That one I get all the time. And another one, but this one is really annoying. Um, um, <laughs> I've been asked, um, so you're a marine painter and you live so far from the water. I say, <laughs> the Hudson River is about 100 feet from here. And you can go anywhere in the world. And that's why I'm interested in boats and, and marine activity. But um, yeah, so we have- um, so, yeah, so we have that in common yeah. and the, the, the small town experience and uh, trying to, um, you know, what I try to do with that is what I try to do with other books, which is what I said before, you're, I mean, I'm sitting with some old guy who's a real badass mob guy in his, in his early days, he's now in his eighties. And I'm, I have to sympathize with him. I have to identify with him, even when he's telling me he's doing some, about doing some things that are pretty unsavory. Um, and that's not hard, especially when you're with the person. You know, you can, you know, there's that human connection. Thing. Yeah, but you didn't make any fast moves. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but he, we, we were in his nursing home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think um, we should uh, open it up a little bit. If anybody has questions or comments uh, about any of these amazing uh, paintings, for example.
Here we go. So we uh, do have one from our online audience that okay. goes to uh, painting Dutch scenes and is writing about Dutch scenes. So our, our um, virtual audience asks, both of our distinguished guests have a passion for our history and our Dutch historical lineage. What intrigues both of you about this history? And what do you see that has not yet been said, written, or illustrated that they would encourage somebody to pursue? What is it about the Dutch? Um, with me, it was I was interested in New York's beginnings because I was living in New York City and I knew they were Dutch, of course. Everybody, even at that time, I knew New York had once been New Amsterdam. Uh, and I don't know, probably if it had been uh, the, the Turks who founded New Netherland, I would have, uh, you know, gone to Istanbul and talked to people there. So, but, you know, there is something about, uh, and this is what I've tried to explore, what the Dutch brought, what they pioneered, who they were, how they developed as a culture, which is distinct from most other people in Europe, and that that got transferred to New York, and that made New York uh, uh, unique in the American colonies. Um, I think in terms of what's been unexplored or what is waiting to be discovered about the 17th century Dutch in New York are the stories are almost um, infinite. Um, the, there are as many stories as there were uh, settlers here. Uh, some of the stuff that fascinates me uh, that I have not painted, but I, I think it's it would make a great story or a, a great painting are uh, we associate cattle drives with cowboys. Well, the Dutch had cattle drives. They drove cattle from Long Island to uh, Delaware. And there are records of this, this, this epic movement of this livestock across that terrain. And I, I find that it's not the West, it's not the Wild West, but it's something completely different. And I guess a, another aspect of that time period is there's uh, the in-town sort of urban story of Manhattan. And then there are all these outlying uh, fortified settlements like Albany, or uh, Newcastle in uh, Delaware. And then there are all these um, uh, courageous, young, uh, adventurous uh, men and women who decide to go off and live in, in uh, the wilderness. And those stories are, are captivating. I just finished a, a painting for um, uh, that's being used by uh, an author named uh, Sarah Cedar, Cedar Miller, who's doing a history of Central Park. And um, the painting was a, is a depiction of a farmstead, not in Manhattan, uh, not in the area around Fort Amsterdam, which is the settled area, the wall at Wall Street. You're somewhat secure there, but in the 1630s, 1637, two Walloon brothers, um, managed to secure some kind of uh, ownership, I guess, of a piece of property way up on Manhattan, uh, sort of between Hellgate and the Hudson River, which is now the north end of Central Park. And they build a farm, but they, it's sort of half farm and half fort. Um, so that was, a, a, that was an interesting experience to explore that. And I know there are, you know, hundreds of other stories like that of these uh, people who have gone off and tried to set up a life outside of the patroonship. Anybody else? So, Slamma Hassel, could you tell us a little bit about things that you are going to do, or current projects that you're working on, and where do you find inspiration for your next projects? I'm uh, in the early stages of working on a book that will be kind of a sequel, I guess, to Island in the Center of the World, focused on the takeover of Manhattan by the English. So it'll be as much an English story as a Dutch one. And I was actually going to uh, answer that previous question by saying that um, it's, a, it's a momentous, obviously a momentous event in American history. Um, and we know a lot more about it now than uh, we did not long ago. Um, 
because the work that Charlie and Yanni have been doing, they, uh, there's a couple of volumes of uh, translations which have yet to be published, um, but they uh, go right up to that period, right up to the period of takeover. So you're from the Dutch side, you have this whole sense then of what this colony had become, what Manhattan was, what uh, New Amsterdam was, and the, uh, how vibrant it was, what the Dutch were doing, and the English knew that. Um, the English, especially in New England, knew that. Um, so we have a better sense of what they were fighting for. You know, so that's just uh, one example of, uh, you know, the, the new things that are still coming out that shed light and give you then, uh, in this case, a chance to focus on, you know, that's, that's then that moment, that sort of 12 days or so when the English ships are in the harbor and there's this, you know, partly comic, partly, you know, threat of, you know, violence, uh, the standoff, and then the, 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 the negotiators. And you know that little period of time, to me, it's almost like a play. And it's a standalone event, but it's so much uh, history falls from it. Just um, to name one thing, the history of slavery in America. Both the English and the Dutch were ramping up at that moment. 12 days before the, the actual, the, before the, ship, the English ships arrived, the first significant shipment of from a Dutch ship with 290 uh, enslaved Africans arrived. So the Dutch, and that probably tripled the number of enslaved people in the colony. Uh, and so they, that comes into the port, they're being unloaded, here comes the English, and they have with them the intention to, I mean, they're developing this notion to take over this piece of the colony in order to, then they'll have the whole coast and they'll be able to, um, to uh, reorganize it and, and, and ramp up agriculture and use enslaved labor for that. So, you know, a lot hangs on that moment, on that sort of 12 day period. So I have a, a couple of projects that I'm working on in New Paltz. Um, I'm doing a, a, a stone house uh, painting uh, of one of the buildings on Huguenot Street. And um, I'm also doing another native piece. Um, some of you probably noticed the painting of the Muncie fisherman taking the 200 pound uh, sturgeon out of the Walk Hill River. Well, as a kind of uh, complementary piece to that, I'm doing a painting of uh, a weaver um, who is teaching children how to weave. And uh, that'll be set, um, uh, the setting for that will be uh, a wigwam that was uh, discovered by an archaeologist in New Paltz, so I'm going to be using that as sort of the background, but it'll be more, that painting will be more about the community, um, so that there'll be the, the piece about providing food and the piece about the teacher kind of passing along a craft. Um, I'm also working uh, on a project uh, at the New York State Museum, which is a, a very detailed uh, digital model of Beverwick. And um, the model is, um, is, is intended to be somewhat interactive. Um, and that's exciting uh, because um, like, like a lot of projects, there's pieces of Albany in, in the 17th century that I have come across, but I've never really thought of it in, a, in physical terms. And so a few things that have happened with that model is new places have been discovered that would make great subjects for paintings. Um, like uh, one that sort of struck me was there was a small bridge that was built over the Ruttenkill that was um, quite far uh, west of Fort Orange, but it was up a bit on a hill. So from a perspective above that bridge, you could look down the Ruttenkill Creek uh, to the fort, which I only discovered because of the proximity of those things uh, that uh, were arranged on the digital model. So those are some things that are going on. John. So we have a virtual uh, participant who wanted to know about the origins of your friendship. Uh, they said, you seem to have such a good rapport with each other. So they were wondering where you first <laughs> met and how that relationship developed. I'm sure it was through Charlie. And it was, it was quite a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, Charlie brought you out to the uh, studio. Uh, I don't, you must have been doing research for Island. I guess, yeah. uh, maybe something like yeah. that. Yeah, so it, that, that was really my, I guess, my first introduction mm -hmm. to you was your process. 
Oh, no, you were because you showed me yeah. your work, how, how you work. Yeah. I didn't think you stood a chance. Really. Yeah. <laughs> You're still out. Oh, I don't know. I'm doing okay. <laughs> But we did. We we've done a, a couple of things together. You were referring yeah. before to this uh, uh, um, investigation into the actual location of uh, Peter Stuyvesant's mansion in uh, Manhattan, Lower Manhattan, um, and we kind of went back and forth. Uh, we did mostly like email and PowerPoints, yeah. sending it back that and forth to each other. And yes, yeah, that, that was yeah. Um, so we. Uh, have con tentatively concluded that it was not where many have uh, believed it to be, but is actually appropriately enough in the middle of Stuyvesant Town yeah. uh, at the corner of like 15th and Avenue A or yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, when you were talking about the project that you're working on, um, I think it's so fascinating that uh, the cat, one of your the characters that you're writing about is Nichols. Mm -hmm. Nichols is sort Richard of Nichols, the English. He's uh, sort of the main player. I yeah, mean, he's, yeah. He he takes his orders from the monarchy, mm -hmm. and he's got to implement all of that here. And it's really uh, Nichols that's um, kind of responsible for the Dutch culture having a future, right? Um, but I, I, what I'm really curious about that I'm sure you're going to come across in the book is that relationship how Nichols affected Stuyvesant. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that's because Stuyvesant stays. Yeah, getting down to the personal level is, is what's yeah. exciting. Um, and Richard Nichols is the uh, commander of the squadron that comes in on behalf of yeah. James, the Duke of York, and, and takes over. Uh, but the interplay between him and Stuyvesant, and then once he takes over, he becomes the first governor of New York. And uh, it's... He is the one then who's leading uh, the English uh, as they negotiate with the Dutch over these, you know, extremely lenient terms uh, by which they'll hand the place over, basically allowing Dutchness just to remain a feature yeah. of the place. Uh, yeah, the way he exercised power and what that says about who he was. Yeah, I think that's going to be a fascinating that's, uh, story. Yeah, and, he, and he's under, uh, you know, there's a big encyclopedia of New York City. Uh, that was edited, I think, by Ken Jackson's you know, really thick thing. There is not an entry on Richard Nichols. He was the first governor of New York. Wow. I mean, it's so, wow. it's such a rich, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah, he's a character, you can't leave him out. And, um, but it, 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 it struck me when we were working on the Stuyvesant thing that, um, that he would take property and stay there, stay in Manhattan. And he had such animosity about, the, about English rule and yet, um, who are you talking about? Nichols? Peter Stuyvesant. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, so I, I think um, that time period. That's it's really an interesting time period. It didn't. We weren't Dutch, and then in 1664 we were English. It didn't. That it didn't happen that way. It it the the evolution was really really slow, and it's still going on today. Uh, one of the stories that I think is, is kind of fun is um, um, Claverack Landing, which, is, which became Hudson, New York, uh, was basically a little uh, uh, landing on the Hudson River that uh, was occupied mostly by uh, Hogaboom's warehouse and Ben Allen's uh, warehouse. And right across the river was Athens, New York. And um, so in, now we're talking about the, 18, uh, the, the late 17, 1780s, um, the Quakers come from Nantucket. They're, they're looking for a place to start a whaling community and they buy Claverack Landing from the, the Dutch who, who own it. And it becomes this New England town. So, um, you know, 1820, 1830, it's very English on that side of the river. In Athens, they're still speaking Dutch. Mm -hmm. they're, they're only, you know, they're not even a mile apart. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So th that's the, I think that's what makes New York such a rich Dutchness place. persisted. Yeah. Dutchner, Dutchness persisted in Albany until the, I think the French and Indian War is what really, because there's so many English soldiers were settled here. Yeah. Uh, and then I think all the young people sort of, sort of looked up, wanted to be like them. They realized, okay, this is the future where we want to 
uh, start speaking English and that kind of thing. But until then, this was a very Dutch community, yeah. and that's eighty plus years after the takeover. So. Did your did your parents speak Italian in your house? No, it was my grandparents. No, my parents spoke Italian. They were both born in America, but they, they still spoke Italian. None of my brothers or I, none of us. Uh, we only knew that when we were being talked about. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was how it was with my like with my mother and her with her parents. Yeah. They spoke Italian. Yeah. Her father spoke Italian. Yeah. But um, but he didn't, and it, I think it didn't occur to them to teach it to the kids, and they didn't want you know they wanted them to be Americans. They so can't want... you imagine that with these Dutch farmers? Yeah, exactly. And it was typically, according to Charlie. Uh, the women preserved the Dutch language because men went out and they were in the community and they had to speak English, but the Dutch preserved, the women preserved the, the values and the language. Yeah. Thank you all. This has been fun. Tamis, thank you so much. Thank you, Len. Thank you. Thank you.